As Dickon Langhorn finished preparing his master's horse, he looked over the turning grounds and saw his future. The seventh son of a family of 14, Dickon would never inherit any great lands or money. The Langhorn name wouldn't gain him access to any great banquets or honors. All he had was a lance, a sword, and a dream. And of course, a squireship. He had been 12 when he was taken under Sir Tymond. He was now 19, and a far greater swordsman than his master, which Sir Tymond did his best to hide. Dickens stood and went to the Seventh River, a tavern near the turning grounds. There, a huge, white-haired, purple-eyed knight sat emptying a flagon of ale, a tavern wench on his lap. Dickens sighed, picked up a tankard of ale from a table of chattering Ebenese, and dumped the amber liquid over Edric's head. The giant roared in anger and threw the girl off his lap as if she were a rag doll and he turned and drew his sword. Then the rage turned to surprise, then laughter. Dickon, you son of a whore, you got me again! Dick smiled at his friend. Maybe, if you were more aware of your surroundings, there would be more fine ale in the world. Edric laughed again. More aware? I've been evading Valerian cell swords for nigh on twenty years. Don't get me started on my opinions of ale. The pair roared in laughter and walked to the exit of the tavern. The soaked horror scoffed audibly in their wake. As the door opened and flooded their eyes with brilliant sunlight, Dickon remembered his reason for collecting Edric in the first place. Did you hear? Lord Aaron's calling knights. He plans to attack the lands of the mountains. Edric's response was a derisive snort. The man's brave, I'll give him that. The other attackers have been ambushed or crushed by rocks. If he can do it, I'll be impressed. But I think our best bet is this Varric person. Word around the tavern is he's a capable warrior, smart, and charismatic. Sounds like the perfect leader. Dickens smiled. That's why we're going to the tournament, isn't it? As the companions reached the pavilions, where the contestants were to prepare themselves for the coming battles, the pair began to seek shelter for themselves and their horses. Tourney tents are traditionally first come first serve, however, Edric had a rather persuasive method of obtaining a tent in a prime location. He burst into the tent, grabbed the resident knight by the scruff of his neck and tossed him out. His reputation and size afforded him silence for many knights who happened to witness the event. Meanwhile, Diggin entered the next tent over speaking eloquently of the finer tents to be had across the turning grounds. Smiling as the knights left, he wondered if they would enjoy the smell of the brothel's latrines, or if they would come back and try to reclaim their fine tent. If they did, he would introduce them to Edric. The next day saw the opening of the competition. The pair met outside their tents as the morning sun was beginning to burnish the sky with orange and gold. Edric was already in his gallant black plate mail, silver kissing the edge of each segment. Beneath his arm was his glimmering black helm, its plume of purple peacock feathers bent lazily in the morning breeze. Tickin's armor was less ornate, mismatched, and worn from whatever knight had owned it last. He pulled his greaves up to his elbow and flexed his hand to settle them into place. He looked Edric up and down and scoffed audibly. Without a word, the companions began the short march to the turning grounds, eyeing the competition as they passed. There was a painfully thin cohort with a spear, and a shy battle priest riding a striped horse, even a Dothraki screamer with his curved arc, and a naked torso grooming a mighty brown horse. The two disregarded them all. Had they been capable warriors, they would have no need to travel to the heart of Endalos in order to compete in the tournament. Edric was an exception, and everyone knew him as such. Each warrior they passed could hardly keep from staring at the famous Edric Delmar, Dragon Bane. Dickon rolled his eyes and glanced over at his companion. You know, I need a knighthood. Many need money. You have both. Why are you here? Edric snorted. 
Got bored of killing pirates and valerians, I suppose. Got bored of knighting your friends, too. Edric sighed. For the last time, I'm a landless knight. I would only be able to knight you if you were my squire. I'm sorry. You gotta find another way. Hopefully this will be it. Hopefully. As the pair neared the tourney grounds, a large crowd had gathered at the entrance. What in the seven hells is all this then? Edric scoffed, craning his neck to see above the crowd. He was already a head taller than any man in the crowd, yet the mob was so massive it took him a moment before he cursed and told Dick on what he saw. It's Lionel Redfield. The crowd parted enough for Dickon to make out the fabled Sir Redfield. He was atop his chestnut destrier, wearing brilliant silver armor, gleaming in the morning sunlight. Flares of crimson enamel streaked across his torso, and a black crow emblazoned the chest of his doublet. The visor of his great helm was raised to reveal his ruddy face. The hint of a beard adorned his chin and cheeks, and his long hair flowed from beneath his helm. The son of a whore, he takes credit for killing Mogo the Horse Lord, and then has the gall to show up here after proclaiming knighthood. He certainly appears to be a crowd favorite, Dickon goaded, grinning wryly and looking up at Edric. His companion had grown red in the face, his eyes locked onto the gallon light. If it bothers you so much, you'll be able to challenge him in the tournament. This did not appear to calm his friend, but Edric loosened his grip on his sword and nodded slightly. They all think he's the ideal knight, brave and dutiful, but they weren't there to see him stab the pirate king Ceres in the back. When I get my hands on him, I'll crumple him into a ball and throw him into the sun. Edric's voice was calm, murderous, and bitter cold. That's the spirit, Dick inside, and the pair continued their march toward the competitor's tent. As Dickon Langhorn finished preparing his master's horse, he looked over the turning grounds and saw his future. The seventh son of a family of 14, Dickon would never inherit any great lands or money. The Langhorn name wouldn't gain him access to any great banquets or honors. All he had was a lance, a sword, and a dream. And of course, a squireship. He had been 12 when he was taken under Sir Tymond. He was now 19, and a far greater swordsman than his master, which Sir Tymond did his best to hide. 